So Boris uh, Dasuta, uh, we're talking about GR Atina plus plus. So please, Boris, take it away. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So of course, it has not just been work done by myself, but also uh, collaborators that I've listed here. And there is a shameless uh, sort of preprint plug uh, for some more information about this. But let's get underway. So with some initial motivation and perhaps to fix an initial goal, and what we'd like to do and uh, what I will discuss here is to think about studying intermediate mass ratio or spin ratio, uh, binary black hole or DBH systems. So on this front, mathematical world poisonous properties and numerical techniques uh, for various formulations in numerical relativity are quite mature. And we have heard earlier to speak about these. Uh, however, uh, there's uh, something curious going on because the high ratio BBH sort of part of the vacuum theory is a bit less explored. And there's uh, some good reason for this. So currently many in our codes rely on a sort of uh, computational domain strategy, which involves fully overlapping patch-based structures that look at or could be called box in box. And there is a potential to suffer from computational inefficiency. So what I mean is that as you attack problems where, for example, you need more and more refinement and you need uh, more and more high performance uh, computational infrastructure to deal with them, uh, just throwing more resources at the thing is not going to necessarily get you there because efficiency degrades as you do this. So another kind of point of view to take here perhaps is that what are the current trends in HPC? So the trends there seem to be towards more and more massive parallelism rather than increasing per node uh, computational power, say. So, okay, here's perhaps an alternative offering. Why don't we change the grid structure a bit? And I realize also that there have been talks uh, to this end earlier this week with uh, Amrex and Carpetex. Uh, here, I will discuss this kind of octree grid strategy where we may be able to get something out of it. And of course, ultimately, once you get a handle on all this stuff, you want to investigate the black hole neutron star or DNS events. So, all right, this is a talk about GR Athena++, but what is Athena++? So just to give you a little bit of a notion here and to set the stage for some things later, uh, Athena++ is an astrophysical MHD code. Uh, out of the box, what you can do is you can solve a variety of MHD problems on prescribed backgrounds. So you need to have in your hands a line element that you uh, uh, write down. You can do this, however, in whatever sort of coordinate system you care to do it in. A nice feature is that we have, or well, there is this kind of modular uh, structure of the code base. And a nice uh, computational approach that it takes is this kind of task-based computational model. So if you are not fully familiar with what that is, essentially you write down a list of tasks that describe your full calculation and sub-steps are represented by a task. The point of this is that if you have two things that you could, for example, do at once, like communicate some data while computing something else, that you gain some efficiency in doing this. So another thing that, of course, the modularity gives you is that you can partition away some of the logic. So, okay, here we deal with the grid structure, there we deal with some physics detail, and this is quite nice conceptually, and it makes for more maintainable code. And, okay, so our grid structure is in the nomenclature, this mesh structure, if you like, and this will be used in the domain decomposition, or if we introduce refinement, it will be used there. And uh, just to make it all concrete, we are building off a very recent version 19 of Athena++, where there is a link to this code here. Okay, so what does this computational domain look like concretely, and how do we deal with that? How do we set up problems? How should we think of this? So what ends up happening is that we have an overall representation of some chosen domain of interest. So let's call that capital omega. And we can think of this as a kind of logical n rectangle. And this is stored in this mesh class. 
further details. So you want to now actually pick things like, okay, well, how large is this thing? So stuff like spatial extent, what sort of coordinatization you're putting on this, how the boundary conditions are. Uh, this also gets stored at initial level. So, all right, we've got this kind of abstract definition of a domain. How do we actually start sampling things? How do we decompose all this stuff? So I will use a shorthand N sub M, which, if, which is meant to represent a tuple of uh, samplings along each relevant dimension of your problem. So if you've got a 3D spatial problem, then you will have a three tuple, 2D, you'll have a two tuple and so on. Or if you like numbers, then you can have a mesh level sampling of 128, 128, 128, say, and I'll just call that 128. So we've got a sampling of our domain overall. How do we partition that thing? Well, we can break it up into these smaller kind of logical cubes or rectangles, if you like. And here, again, with a similar sort of uh, style, I'll denote this as NB, and then we pick a sampling uh, in a similar fashion. The caveat is that your smaller cubes must divide component-wise your larger domain. So, okay, we do this. Each of these uh, smaller elements which partition the mesh, we refer to as mesh block objects, and the sampling in each mesh block object is controlled by this parameter NB. Another thing that we get immediately out of the box with Athena++ is that we have cell-centered and face-centered sampling possible for grids. Of course, uh, to deal with the MHD, there's also some edge centering, but fine. Okay, so we have this sort of setup. Whatever salient fields we're talking about when we're dealing with some sort of evolution problem or so are stored when sampled within the mesh block objects. Okay, so that's a bunch of words. Let's actually look at a figure because this is probably much clearer then. So here I want to show uh, two distinct things. So we have our underlying domain omega, and this is being decomposed into mesh blocks as shown. And we would like to hierarchically arrange this data in such a way that we can, for example, communicate data between blocks efficiently. So we follow this sort of uh, tree-like arrangement where we pick a parameter n such that two to the n is greater than whatever is the maximum number of uh, blocks along whatever dimension. This gives you a logical level. The physical level here is all the same. So note that physical and logical levels can be distinct. And then the question is, okay, well, how do we arrange this data in memory? So the idea is that we can assign to each of these blocks, of course, some uh, 3D index. But what we can do is we can then encode that by writing a map from a 3D index to a 1D index. And there are many ways to do this, but if you use this so-called Morton ordering, then you get something quite nice. So this goes as follows. If I stare at the centroid of each of these individual mesh blocks, then I can trace according to this Morton ordering a curve through them. And if you notice, if I pick some centroid, so let's pick this one here labeled by six. If I perturb very slightly the parameter on the curve, then I end up at seven or five. And these are spatially somehow close. So if you do this, you get gain in efficiency. Maybe another way to see this is that if I take this cube, and if I imagine splitting the work needed to be done on each of these mesh blocks as follows, so I split it over two nodes, say, and I split in the x, z plane. So everything to the left of where my pointer is is on one node, everything to the right of my pointer is on another node, then you can see that many operations will have, you know, quote communication that's being handled locally in memory rather than having to find things all over the place. Okay, so that's the decomposition. Maybe just a quick glance at what refinement would look like with this sort of setup. So here, I just introduce some fixed level of refinement in this bottom right-hand corner. And I imagine that this domain omega has some outflow conditions. So the things to note here, is that there is a recursive subdivision when you want to achieve a particular resolution at some point. So what I mean by this is that I have a block, let's say here, 
and its neighbors are in a two to one ratio. So its neighbor gets split in two, and then the relevant block where the refinement is desired gets split in two again, and then we keep doing this. So there is this two to one constraint, or two to one ratio, if you like. Uh, maybe also for the sake of curiosity, if you instead were to introduce something like periodic conditions on this cube, then this constraint would induce refinement in this corner where my mass pointer is now, because you would associate this corner with this one down here, and the ratio must be maintained throughout. Okay, so that's sort of a Athena plus plus in a nutshell, at least for the computational stuff. Uh, what have we done in GR Athena? So we introduce a variety of things. We have introduced a high order finite difference, and we follow a templating approach just for the sake of efficiency. Uh, further to this, you can of course imagine uh, sitting down and trying to implement something like, oh, I want to compute I don't know, rigid tensor or something like that. Well, it could be handy to uh, leverage the fact that you've got some initial symmetries in there, and maybe you don't want to write something that looks completely horrible. So we extend this underlying Athena array object into Athena tensor, which uh, allows for support for these sorts of uh, symmetries and cuts down further on memory usage. Uh, in our formulation, which we have uh, included, is Z4C. So if you like, this is uh, some flavor of BSSN plus an additional thing, but roughly speaking, it's like that. And for the sake of uh, this problem, we proceed by working with uh, a puncture representation of black holes. Uh, so in full, we couple, uh, we use a chi variant of the moving puncture gauge. We have this uh, one plus log uh, slicing. In order to actually impose a suitable refinement at a given point, well, we introduce a trackers. So wherever we have a black hole center, wherever it wanders, we want to preferentially put refinement in that location. And that's uh, the point of these. In addition to this, uh, we introduce geodesic spheres. And I will make some more comments on this uh, shortly. Uh, here, of course, the idea is that you are you have a variety of, let's say, control quantities or physical quantities that you wish to extract. And generally, these are specified on some integral over some two sphere of some radius. And so these are meant to capture uh, this. In particular, here, we do GW extraction based on Vilescalar using these geodesic spheres. And then the last thing I'll say here, perhaps, is that we also extend support to vertex centering. And so for this, we extend the boundary communication, and then we have to deal with a new uh, sort of restriction and prolongation. And here I'll, I'll make a comment that, uh, of course, it, it's uh, <laughs> it's nice to try to follow the principles that are in the underlying package, right? So you have modularity, so we try to maintain this. Uh, there is a, a sort of caveat that happens when when you uh, wish to write down some finite difference operator, say, uh, it can be quite important to ensure that the order of floating point operations is uh, written in a symmetrized way. So we try to uh, be careful with these sorts of things. So, okay, I'll uh, make a further comment about Z4C. So again, uh, roughly speaking, it's a conformal formulation. Uh, here one has, an incorporation of constraint damping. And on top of this, one also enforces uh, some algebraic constraints for stability. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you look at the dynamical fields that I evolved, this is essentially BSSN if you pretend that this uh, theta term is not here. And of course, uh, when one looks at evolution, one thing to monitor is uh, or are things like the constraints, so you know, Hamiltonian contraction of momentum, or we can do a sort of collective uh, viewpoint. Uh, so far, we have particularized our implementation to Cartesian coordinates. This could in future potentially be extended, but so far we work with this. And uh, coming back to the evolution approach that we're taking and the H description, uh, I will just emphasize that away from a puncture point, uh, we have manifestly regular evolution. Another thing perhaps also to say explicitly, because often this is a bit swept under the rug, is that 
the global boundary conditions that we impose, so on the boundary of our domain, uh, we use a quite naive choice, but we have found that it performs uh, quite well. So we use a Sommerfeld uh, second order centered. And then uh, we can do all these things variously. So we can do either a vertex centered or cell centered approach. So a vertex centering here, I would like to maybe just give a little bit more detail on this and perhaps some motivation why it's nice to have. And to do that, it's maybe cleanest to see it in 1D. So first of all, of course, when you have this sort of uh, decomposition, you need to be able to communicate data between distinct elements of your decomposition. So if we're doing this uh, finite difference uh, scheme, uh, then we append a small layer of ghosts on either end. So in this uh, upper figure labeled by I, now you can imagine this as being uh, the fundamental uh, representation of a variable or the, the lattice that a variable will be sampled over on a mesh block. And then associated to this, you also have a coarsened representation. Now, if you glance at these and you will very quickly notice something. So vertically, many nodes actually line up. And this is essentially the kind of the big advantage of vertex centering that we uh, exploit. Because if you're thinking about transferring data from a level to level, then, okay, if we start on find and we want to perhaps do a restriction to this course level, but if you imagine approximating this restriction operator through some kind of Lagrangian interpolation, then you find that, oh, I'm evaluating or wanting to evaluate data on a, a node or root of my polynomial. So this, this ends up just being a copy in this direction. Conversely, if you're doing a prolongation from course to find, then again, it's only really interspersed nodes that you have to worry a bit about. So, okay, that uh, seems like a nice potential performance advantage. There's of course uh, nothing for free ever. So we do end up with a couple of disadvantages. The first one being, if you consider these blue nodes and you consider what nodes the neighbor to these or the neighbors to this block has, then there will also be a shared node. And during the course of an evolution, it's quite crucial to maintain the same value on these shared interface nodes. So that's something that has to be taken care of. In 1D, this is quite trivial. I mean, you can only share it in one way. You either have a neighbor or you don't, and okay. But in 2D, this becomes more complicated because in some, well, the, the multiplicity, so how many distinct blocks a node is shared between can change depending on location and depending on refinement levels. Uh, another potential disadvantage is if you really uh, stick to having a uh, fine and a coarse representation on the same mesh block, you may need to communicate more data depending on how you do it. So just to give an image of what this would look like in 2D, I have a left panel and a right panel here. And local, uh, here I provide a local view of the mesh, which is meant to be the same in both cases. And it's partitioned such that I have a coarser block, which is omega A, and then I have two finer, block, uh, two finer blocks to the right, which are at one level finer. So they are omega B, omega C. And so if we focus on this left panel for a moment, we can ask, okay, what does populating ghosts look like in this situation? Or what sort of procedure do I need to go through to do that? So the way that we go about this is that we start with these purple nodes, which are on top of these uh, green circles, and we perform a restriction. So recall, this is just a trivial copy based on how we construct the operator. And then what we do is we populate, or we set a task that will communicate this data to fill these green nodes in the coarser mesh block. We can think about the opposite uh, direction. So now I uh, focus on the right panel here. And what I do is I start on the coarser mesh block. And now uh, here, what we do is we first uh, communicate things. So we start with these dark circles. We uh, communicate and fill these dark green squares. But thereafter, we have a blocking operation. So we have to wait until sufficiently many neighboring green squares are filled before we perform the prolongation. 
So in 2D, this looks like this. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you imagine, so let's pick on the left panel here, this node in green. And if we think about the neighbors that this node has, so we'll have a neighbor to the south, a neighbor east, and then uh, southeast. And so that's shared between, well, four in this case, uh, but the node up one from that is only shared between two. So one can deal with this by uh, dynamically accumulating how many nodes or how many mesh blocks a given node is shared between, and then performing an appropriate averaging with the appropriate factor. And that's what we do. So the next thing I would maybe make a small comment about would be the geodesic spheres. So here, what we thought to do was to, well, is essentially work with these uh, refined icosahedra. So you start, in order to construct these, you start with a regular icosahedron. So if you recall, this is just 20 plane equilateral triangles. And you can imagine taking one of these and then performing a subdivision. So you can arbitrarily further refine and get whatever sort of local uh, sampling that you desire. And for now, what we do is we only exploit this for numerical quadrature. And uh, here, what I will show is that we use this for calculating gravitational wave content. And this is based on the vial scalar. So this is a, a standard uh, thing we do. We compute psi and then we perform the projection and okay. Uh, one interesting thing that's quite nice about these spheres, which I will point out, is that if you contrast the spacing of nodes on these spheres to taking just the standard spherical coordinate system and sampling uniformly in theta and phi and plotting that, then comparing that figure, you would find a clustering of points towards the poles. Whereas here, we achieve a much more uniform sort of distribution of nodes. All right, so we have all these uh, fancy features that we'd uh, like to actually check that they are working nicely together. So what sort of strategy uh, should we take here? So as a first sort of uh, step to doing this, uh, we need to pick a mesh refinement strategy. And uh, what we end up doing is we end up uh, emulating something that looks a little bit like box and box structure. So this is uh, done for convenience and for reasons of comparison. And I will show in the next slide uh, image of this. Uh, however, I will point out that it's uh, not this kind of nested fully overlapping thing. Okay, if we are uh, attacking DBH, then we need data from this. So to this end, we make use of two punctures, uh, thorn essentially in order to generate initial data. And then we want to compare to some yeah, previously found results. So we do a comparison for runs from this so-called calibration paper uh, where this code base BAM was used. So we'll do a direct code to code comparison based on this. And then if you find that, okay, this is satisfactory, then the next question is, okay, well, it seems like this stuff is working, but we'd like to actually do maybe some physics with it. And well, what's interesting here would be something like looking at uh, gravitational waveform modeling or so. And in this case, uh, one doesn't want to do just a very, very short run, uh, but uh, think about uh, something like eccentricity reduced runs. So here you have much longer wave trains in principle, and you need to have phase accuracy over many, many, many more orbits. Uh, for this comparison, as you can imagine, because it's a much longer calculation, uh, we do instead of a direct comparison with BAM, a uh, comparison with EOB. So in particular, we compare against the TEOB resum S. And yeah, we are, well, this is quite demanding because we're essentially testing everything at once and making sure that everything is consistent. It's so, okay, as promised, I wanted to show what this kind of emulated uh, box and box thing looks like. So here is one of the initial configurations that we do testing with. And you can see that initially we start out or I'm plotting X, Y plane slice, and we have two on axis puncture centers at equal zero. 
and then we propagate the forward in time a little bit. So we have our grid dynamically adapting based on what the tracker is telling us that the location of the center is currently. And so maybe another comment to make here is that by doing this kind of um, emulated uh, grid, by just fixing uh, what uh, ratios of resolutions in different locations should look like, uh, we end up with something quite convenient in terms of matching local resolutions against other codes that use the strategy. So right, let's actually concretely put some numbers on this and uh, look at what these tests uh, give us. So uh, collectively, I call a collection of calibration tests where we have, first of all, sort of maybe the simplest situation to start, uh, we set up a single spinning puncture. Then we increase the complexity and we say, okay, well, uh, let's look at a deviation spiral that's quite short. And we uh, check, we do some convergence testing to make sure everything is working nicely. Uh, okay, uh, how are the various elements of this controlled? So, as you recall, uh, when I was talking about this vertex centering, we have to introduce some ghosts to affect the communication. And the choice of ghosts ends up controlling the overall uh, scheme, if you like. And here I will show results for fourth order and sixth order in various places for the spatial discretization. For the temporal discretization, we are sticking with fourth order Rankuta. Uh, whereas uh, the physical domain, well, okay, we can just pick a large Cartesian domain and one can compute, for example, quite directly based on parameters that enter you know, what the resolution of the puncture ends up being, what the wave zone resolution is, or you can invert the thing and say, okay, I would like such a resolution, how many levels do I need, or what size domain do I need to manage this? And just for the sake of later clarity, we compute directly Psi-4 modes within GR Athena, but things like gravitational strain, so derived quantity, say uh, these we compute externally after the calculation. It's all right. What do we find for the single spinning puncture? Uh, here uh, we are, or I'm showing a result from computation with BAM against a result computed with Jira Athena, and then the difference of the two. So overall, this is being performed at fourth order. And I'm showing the two zero mode of the gravitational strain uh, as a function of uh, the tortoise coordinate. On the right hand side, we do a sort of mini convergence test where we compute at a puncture resolution that's coarse and then medium and then fine. And then based on the formal order chosen for the spatial scheme, so fourth order, we perform uh, rescaling by what would be an anticipated uh, convergence factor. And the point is that, okay, if the difference between the result at the course and medium can be rescaled in an appropriate fashion such that they agree with the difference between the medium and the fine, then uh, you probably do have this convergence. And so we find that, okay, we get something qualitatively that looks very close. So it's a good indication. So next, uh, let's look at the equal mass in spiral for the short run. So here, I just wanted to show a diagram of one of the punctures spiraling in. And we compute this, we compare BAM versus GR Athena with comparable parameters and so forth. On the right hand side, I show the 2 2 mode of the strain. And we show this for BAM and compare GR Athena. The thing perhaps to notice here is that the phase alignment looks extremely good and uh, amplitude discrepancy at various points uh, looks fairly low. In fact, if you look very carefully, it's uh, under 2%. Of course, one has to look at this a bit more carefully. So we want to do some you know, convergence testing with this. So here uh, to the left, I show a fourth order run results. And to the right, I show a sixth order run results where the order is the order of the spatial discretization. On the top panels, respectively, are shown the 2 2 mode uh, waveforms. On the bottom, what we do is we compare the difference between phase 
at distinct resolutions as indicated. And what has also been done is a rescaling by the anticipated uh, convergence factor based on the order of the scheme underlying. Uh, to notice on the left is that, okay, this rescaling, it looks very, very clean. And this uh, occurs for you know, most of the, the U value that we use to most of the tortoise coordinate. Uh, on the right, uh, this is a bit more noisy, but if you uh, quickly glance at the waveform, you find that, well, these are already basically on top of each other. So we may be already uh, too far into the convergent regime, if you like. So uh, we can't necessarily uh, get such a nice rescaling. But nonetheless, things appear to improve. Now we can also look what happens at merger. So if we look at the phase difference at merger and we look at the fourth order uh, results, and here what we do is we uh, compare a run performed at very high uh, mesh level sampling with all of the individual runs that I showed previously. And we can uh, plot a general trend and see that, okay, it looks like a fairly decent fourth order. Uh, for sixth order, this is less clear. So we can't really make an extremely robust claim here, uh, but this is presumably due to the kind of noisiness and the differences that I was showing earlier. Okay, so the calibration runs uh, look like they are performing well. The next thing to do is to do this kind of eccentricity reduced run. So here uh, we take, oh, yeah, first of all, I will again recall that because these uh, waveforms are of much greater dura duration, uh, more expensive computation. So, you know, if it's 10 times longer and you're using the same number of nodes, it's going to be 10 times more expensive. So, th there was another idea here, and that was to try to reduce the total number of, or well, the total amount of computational resources we require in order to do the calculation. Uh, by instead of just cranking up the mesh level resolution and then getting a massive decomposition, instead of just placing a more and more refinement at the puncture itself. So if you uh, examine this table, then, okay, we have labeled a very, very low resolution run, very low, low, et cetera. And then we have a, a sequence of increasing resolution or decreasing spacing, if you like. And I will point out that the number of mesh blocks is roughly on the order of a thousand. If we were to instead try the other strategy, which was shown previously, where we just crank up in M, then this very quickly balloons. So uh, NM selected as 128 cubed, for example, uh, the number of mesh blocks would, with all other things being held the same, uh, balloon to something like 20,000 or so. But okay, if we uh, do uh, what is indicated and then we perform again these kinds of comparisons with phase differences, then here I show the result for a sixth order run. Uh, what we can do is uh, perform a similar sort of rescaling. And here I'm comparing, so if we focus on the blue dashed, then the phase difference uh, as a function of u between the low resolution and the medium low resolution run, if this is rescaled by the anticipated factor for sixth order, then in principle, this should fall somewhere near the red and green curves. And if you look towards merger, it appears to do this. It's maybe not uh, directly on top, but it follows the trend. And similarly for uh, purple, where this should uh, follow the brown curve. Okay, in the bottom panel, similarly to previous, I can show what the phase difference is at uh, merger. Uh, here, I compare differences between very, very low resolution and a single fixed high resolution. Uh, unfortunately, again, uh, it may be a too strong a kind of claim to make, uh, but clearly we do see uh, things are improving and following a general trend. So it may be the case that the very low, the very, very low resolution data set is a bit too low to make a robust claim. So what else can we do? Well, while these 
there are sorts of convergence uh, tests uh, indicating that uh, things appear to be consistent and working well. We can also compare directly to an EOB uh, model. And here I take the high resolution run and compare it to, to EOB resum S. And so the procedure is that one aligns the output of uh, TOB resum S with uh, GR Athena plus plus at the amplitude peak for the given mode, and then uh, examines what the phase differences are up to uh, merger and then on the ring down. And so we find something on the order of 0.1 and then up to merger and then 0.4 to the ring down, which is again, very encouraging. Okay, so we check carefully that things are working and it appears uh, that we have things that are consistent. Do we actually manage to hit that kind of first goal where or oh, we are trying to make things more efficient such that we can attack larger and larger problems. So obviously to check this, we have to perform scaling tests and we can do two classes of these. So we can do uh, so-called strong and weak scaling tests. And uh, to be a little bit careful and not somehow cheat, uh, what we do is we take the production grid setups that we've been working with. So essentially we have what we used for the calibration BBH. And then uh, we fix uh, spatial discretization order. So here we do this, well, here I show the fourth order and we take a small number of room good time steps. And then we perform strong scaling. So what this is, is you pick a particular problem size. So this is controlled by the mesh level resolution. So this is 64 cubed and 96 cubed and so on. And then what you end up doing is you kind of crank up the number of nodes that you're using, and then you see what sort of speed increase you get. On the other hand, you can do also a so-called weak scaling tests, uh, weak scaling test. So here you scale the problem size with the number of nodes. So here we pick a NN, which has a distinct number of samples in each direction. So initially we select i, j, k equal to one. And we do the calculation on a single node. So we have 128, 64, 64. We then repeat the calculation, doubling the number of nodes and doubling j. So then we have uh, 128, uh, 128, 64. And then we kind of continue cranking the handle. So we double k and, and so on. And you do this uh, cyclically. And we did this uh, testing all the way up to 2048 nodes. And the machines that we did the test shown here on are SuperMOOC NG at LRZ. So first of all, for the strong scaling, uh, we find, well, on the left panel, I show the speed up and below this, the efficiency. And so we find that, okay, we get uh, speed up and efficiency. Well, first of all, this is calculated with respect to the first point in a given uh, resolution uh, series. And okay, based on the machines we're using, uh, we find that we get uh, we can attain efficiencies above 90% all the way up to roughly 10 to the four CPUs. But then there is a question because we look and we see, oh, well, in some situations, there's a little bit of a dip what's going on here. So on the right hand side, what is shown is efficiency, depending on how many mesh blocks you assign per CPU. So the way to understand this perhaps is if you recall this uh, task list computational model, then you have this interleaving of calculation and communication. So if you have a sufficient amount of calculation, uh, then you can mask kind of the hit that you take with computation and you're never kind of stuck there uh, waiting for something to do. So this is sort of the uh, rough explanation for why there is this uh, efficiency degradation if we pick too few uh, mesh blocks per CPU. As a rule of thumb for fourth order- uh, Five minutes. Like, yeah, as a rule of thumb for fourth order runs, we need something like a 33 mesh block per CPU. At sixth order, this goes, uh, which is not shown here, but uh, I recall that goes something like 20. Okay. What's uh, the interruption? What's the size of one mesh block? 
in grid points? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, these are uh, set up in exactly the production runs we had previously. So a given mesh block has uh, 16 cubed uh, points, but this is not counting the ghosts and it's not counting the course level. Okay, thanks. Hmm. Yep. Uh, okay. And uh, now we can also look at the weak scaling. So uh, here uh, we're looking at the CPU time uh, per MPI task, and this is indicated in seconds. And uh, we compare GNU and Intel compilers uh, because it turns out that, uh, okay, Intel does internally some magic voodoo that makes it a little bit faster uh, for some reason. Uh, but, okay, uh, in the top panel, we are uh, showing timing for rank zero. And the nice thing here is that, okay, well, this appears to be roughly constant. I mean, the, you've got a flat line, that's very nice, but all the way up to 10 to the five CPUs. In the bottom panel, uh, what we wanted to investigate is, okay, how much time is being uh, spent within distinct operations? So how much time are we spending in computing the right-hand side of Z4C, for example? How much time is spent in ghost communication? How much time is spent on the level-to-level -level transfer operators? And again, if you look at a distinct number of nodes, the proportions look to be fairly consistent. As mentioned, okay, if you're spending less time, then that's better here. So for Intel, we find that we spend less time. But again, the proportions are also roughly consistent as you move along. And I will uh, note that, okay, these plots were prepared at, by using this uh, efficiency or ensuring this efficiency threshold. So uh, in this test, uh, also these operations that require interpolation included like gravitational wave extraction on these uh, spheres or do they simply not cost enough to show up in this plot? Uh, they are not included in this, I believe, because uh, remember the setup of this is we take a very few uh, Runkuta steps and we found that, okay, it's not necessarily useful uh, to dump uh, GW at every single time step, but you can, you know, if, if you have a, a CFL or if you, sorry, yes. if, you, if you have a, a resolution that induces a CFL such that time is tiny, it's wasteful. So we don't do that. Uh, so, uh, yes, but on the other hand, I also think that individually that operation is quite cheap. So even if it were uh, calculated here, it wouldn't uh, show up. Thanks. Yep. Uh, okay. So to try to uh, summarize, yep, we've got Jair Athena uh, working in vacuum. We've got Z4C coupled to the moving puncture gauge. Uh, we've introduced the vertex centered octree AMR and it appears to be functioning robustly. We did uh, this uh, comparison cross code validation. Uh, we can make, I think, a strong claim that we've certainly seen fourth order convergence rates with convergence analysis. Uh, for sixth order, the situation is a little bit less clean, but we still get improvement. So, one minute. Presumably, uh, picking parameters better, uh, one could see this more cleanly. Uh, we also performed EOB comparison and we found, okay, even for this sort of uh, engineered uh, low resource run, we get something that's quite acceptable uh, in the sense of accumulated uh, phases or EOB in our phases. And uh, we also find this kind of um, efficient and scalable uh, situation when we start really pushing the total number of uh, CPUs. 30 seconds. And yeah, currently we are uh, still working on coupling properly matter. Uh, but okay, I stopped there and I guess I build questions to Ryan. Okay, thank you so much, Boris. That was an excellent uh, talk, and I'm really pleased to see uh, the development for uh, GRSINA. Do we have any more questions from the audience? So either speak up or put your question in the chat. Five please. minutes. Well, could you uh, explain more about the difference between this new method and the older? Uh, uh, moving box mesh environment and which part of the change is, is essential for the improvement of 
penalization efficiency? Uh, sure. So in the case of uh, box and box, uh, you can think of this a little bit like um, a nested uh, onion situation where you have one large box where you have uh, data at every single point in this box and we can imagine it regularly sampled. Then we make a very slightly smaller box within this one and again you have data that's regularly sampled but you need to make sure that you have things that are consistent within this nesting and you start to lose efficiency uh, when you fully implement this. So for example, in what I've shown here, uh, we don't do any uh, subcycling or anything like this. Uh, so can we say that uh, basically we only have one, one layer of grid everywhere? Uh, yes. So uh, strictly speaking, we have uh, one fundamental representation of a variable for the sake of convenience in communicating data, we also carry uh, one coarse grid on each mesh block, but it's not carrying the full hierarchy of all grids above this level. Okay, okay. thank yep. you. Sure. Okay, do we have any other questions? So, I have a question yeah. that is maybe a bit technical. Uh, there are these, uh, Apples with Apple tests that uh, ensure that the formulation is stable, in particular when there's mesh refinement, boundary condition, et cetera, in there. And since you're having kind of a new mesh refinement algorithm, it would be interesting. Did you run these tests? For example, the robust stability test? Yes, we have uh, run all of these tests and they are all in this um, preprint that I uh, show. The only thing that is not shown there is a polarized uh, Gaudi. Okay, yes, no, some of these tests are, they turned out to have problems in the end. Thank you. Mm. Yep, uh, but I think that uh, uh, so, uh, depending on the particular NR formulation that you're using, uh, you may have the different properties within the robust uh, stability kind of battery of tests. I have another question. So why do you, why do you choose the C instead of the Zavo up here? Uh, so, we have found uh, that Z4C appears in some situations to uh, perform a little bit better than CC Z4. Uh, so but yeah, I, I think. Any references talking about the uh, Z4C uh, is uh, better? Off the top of my head, I'm not sure where exactly to point to. Uh, there is a recent paper by Daviero, I, I believe that's the name, uh, where they, they perform uh, an enormous amount of tests with uh, a whole bunch of different formulations where CCZ4 is involved and so is Z4C. So maybe that would be one place to have a look. Okay, thank you. Uh, 